I'm Tom Farr. Welcome to the Religious Freedom Institute um, on this end of this beautiful day in Washington, D.C. It's not often I can say that. I'm just speaking of the weather, of course. I'm not talking about anything else. But uh, there are a number of things going on in the city that uh, has delayed, I'm sure, a number of people that want to join us, so they'll be coming in. We'll, I'm sure, be happy to have them come in, even if late. Delayed our speaker. Uh, this is a dear friend and colleague of many years, Professor William M. Bowden. Uh, some of you may know him. Uh, I'm delighted to have him here at RFI and to be able to introduce him to you to talk to us about this wonderful new book that he's written. I'll make this brief so we can jump right into this. Will N. Bowden is the executive director and the William Powers Jr. Chair at the Clements Center for National Security at the University of Texas in Austin. He also serves as associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and distinguished scholar at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Has his PhD and MA in history from Yale and uh, his BA in history from Stanford. He's a very interesting guy. He lends his talents to many other organizations uh, and has received many awards, including one for teaching. Not one, many for teaching, and you're going to see why in just a few minutes. But before he begins, I want to highlight a few of the early parts of his extraordinary career that have intersected with religious freedom and religion and the origins of RFI, as it turns out. I first met Will in the 1990s when he was a staffer on the Hill. Uh, I have many staffer friends. There's probably a couple in this room. I won't identify them and embarrass them. Will was interesting in that he served both in the House and the Senate and for Democrats and Republicans. That's kind of unusual for staffers, although it happened. But the really interesting thing to me, and in the context of RFI and of this book, is the combination of experience in religion and religious freedom on the one hand and the issue of national security on the other. He began to develop this expertise very early uh, in his career and was involved in the drafting of the International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, and he and I served together in the State Department and the Office of Religious Freedom. He then went to the National Security Council early in his career under President George W. Bush, became the senior director of, uh, what was it, uh, Will? Uh, Strategic Planning. Strategic Planning. And there he worked on a host of strategic planning issues for the White House, including the national security strategy. And as far as I know, unless it happened under President Reagan, he'll tell us, he was the first to get the issue of religious freedom into the national security strategy of the United States. It's not as though we haven't cared about religious freedom before then, but to connect it to the national security of the United States, I think, is a, a terrific accomplishment and is one that certainly we have been interested in uh, throughout the history of the Religious Freedom Institute. And I think you will hear plays a role uh, in this marvelous book that he's written. I think I have a copy here, The Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War and the World on the Brink. Reagan himself was a religious guy, a bit uh, eccentric in his religion, but powerful motivator for him, especially in his approach to the atheist Soviet Union, the Soviet Imperium, and had an impact, which you can see if you, we have some copies of the book out here for you, and I hope you'll look quickly in the index as I do for religion. I always do that, and usually it's missing, but it's not missing in this book. So with that, let me turn it over to my friend and colleague, Professor Will Embaker. Will, join us up here. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and I do want to apologize myself for being so uh, horribly late. Like I said, I was finishing up a talk on this book over at the International Republican Institute and left there at 4.30, and usually it's about 15 minutes down here, but um, 
between the African summit traffic jam and then every Uber and Lyft driver and regular taxi driver deciding it's a good time to not drive tonight because of the African summit. Uh, anyway, it ended up being pretty horrendous. So uh, my apologies. I hope I did not presume too much on, on your time. Uh, I One other thing I want to mention in addition to uh, what Tom was sharing about, uh, not just my background, but our, our shared friendship and partnership over the last quarter century, really, on uh, religious freedom issues is uh, the early origins of the research for this book started with the Religious Freedom Project at uh, the Berkeley Center at Georgetown when Tom was leading and I was honored to be one of the one of the scholars there and I'd been wanted to do a big uh, book with a historical and policy treatment on the relationship between religious freedom and na national security and uh, out of that have evolved uh, this uh, this book on President Reagan's foreign policy and as I share a little bit I think thinking here I hope you'll you'll under, you'll uh, you'll appreciate why those things came together um, a few points I want to make in highlighting uh, the overall argument of this book, and especially the role of religious faith and, and religious freedom in, uh, in understanding Reagan's, Reagan's foreign policy. First, uh, unlike every previous Cold War president, from Truman on up through Carter, uh, Reagan conceived of the Cold War as primarily a battle of ideas that happened to be a great power competition. And that sequencing is very important. Every previous president had seen the Cold War as a great power competition, which happens to be a battle of ideas. So, so every previous president knew that capitalism versus co uh, communism and democracy versus authoritarianism matters. But at the end of the day, the Cold War for them was this static standoff between the nuclear armed Soviet Union and the nuclear armed United States. And Soviet communism was a challenge to be managed. And Reagan instead saw it as a loathsome idea to be defeated. Um, so that's the first important strategic concept. Drawing on that, Reagan wanted to delegitimize Soviet communism. Uh, so how uh, uh, antithetical it was to, to, to freedom and to, to human, human flourishing. But he soon realized that he needed to, it was not just enough to criticize and disparage Soviet communism for its many depredations, but he needed to show a positive alternative. And this, the another strand of his strategy was to enlarge the contours of the free world, hence his support for democracy, human rights, uh, free markets, in some of America's uh, formerly uh, uh, right-wing authoritarian allies. So his support for the democratic transition in South Korea in 1987, uh, the transition from the Marcos dictatorship to democracy in the Philippines in, in 1986, uh, support for a similar transition in Taiwan, uh, support for a similar transition in Chile, and so on and so forth. Um, both of those, first, understanding the Cold War as a battle of ideas, second, seeing the, the need to enlarge the uh, contours of the free world, lead to the primacy of international religious freedom in his strategy. And that's what I want to fo focus on here. In a nutshell, Reagan conceived of the Cold War as a spiritual conflict. He saw it really as, as a religious war uh, between the Judeo-Christian values and religious freedom of the free world and the militant state-sponsored, state-mandated atheism of the, of the, the so so Soviet bloc. And I'll come back in a, in a second to the specific policy initiatives that he perceived, pursued uh, uh, as, a, as a consequence of this reconceptualization of the strategic stakes of the, of the Cold War. But I also want to uh, give a little more color on something that Tom mentioned, which is the role of Reagan's own personal faith. And this was also a, a surprise for me over the course of my research. I'd gone into the research, uh, and Mark and I have talked about this a little bit before, uh, in a sense that Reagan had some sort of personal faith, but you know, didn't go to church, and it might be a little bit instrumentalist, and then there was Nancy's astrology, and you know, some different things going on. Like, How do we make sense of this? Well, what really, what really came out is his uh, faith was much more sincere, devout, uh, closely held uh, than I had uh, certainly had previously appreciated before. And it really shaped his approach to the presidency, his approach to, to for, foreign policy overall. Um, just, a, just a few examples on what I mean by this, because there's, I think, some very direct threads between his own personal faith and these religious freedom policies that he pursues in the context, in the context of, the, of, the, of the Cold War. Um, first is um, when he is uh, nearly assassinated, March 30, uh, 31st, 1981, he's walking out of the Capitol, uh, the Washington Hilton up there in Connecticut Avenue, and the deranged John, gunman John Hinckley uh, shoots him. Uh, Reagan is rushed to the George Washington University uh, emergency room, he's undergoing emergency surgery. We know now he came this close to death. Uh, it was, uh, you know, if the bullet would have been, you know, another millimeter to the, to the right or to the left, it would have, you know, severed a main artery and he would have, he would have bled, out, bled out and died. 
as he was lying on the operating table, you know, losing consciousness and you know, know, knows what has happened and knows the doctor is struggling to save his life, he prays that God will forgive that confused young man who tried to kill him. And then Reagan continues that he felt like, how can I hold anger and hatred in my heart towards this confused young man who tried to kill me, knowing that God has forgiven me of my sins? Um, and he later writes this in his diary. He doesn't do it as speeches, you know, uh, trying to uh, manipulate the uh, the evangelical vote or anything like that. This doesn't come out until two or three decades uh, afterwards. But um, uh, like like I said, that's one of those private moments for him where I realize, okay, there's more of a, a genuine faith here than than uh, than I think many had appreciated before. And then a couple weeks later, as he is uh, back at the White House, um, uh, you know, still recovering, you know, working a working a, a, a light schedule, but trying to you know think through uh, the rest of the rest of his presidency. He again writes in his diary that I feel like God spared me for a reason uh, and he spared me to bring the Cold War to an end. Um, a few weeks after this, of course, in May of 1981, uh, a, the, John Paul II barely survives an assassination attempt as well. Uh, we still don't know for sure, but it seems likely that the KGB had sponsored the, the, the gunman, the assassin, via Bulgarian intelligence. There's some murky stuff there. Again, the Pope also comes this close to dying, and that forges a real uh, affinity between him and Reagan. They had already had some high personal regard when the Pope had first um, uh, had first uh, uh, been, been selected. Reagan had taken great notice of this, especially being the first uh, first Polish Pope. But this uh, shared providential bond that both of them have, that God has spared their lives uh, for for a reason, uh, and that reason being to bring an end to an end to Soviet communism. One more vignette from his uh, his per personal faith, uh, would, which again was was very revealing for me, um, and this just came out uh, a couple couple of years ago. Uh, his, uh, hey, Scott, good to see you. So, she's more friends here. The First Lady, of course, is Nancy Reagan, who is uh, probably Reagan's only close personal friend in life. Uh, he was a child of uh, an alcoholic father. He had never forged many close personal friendships. He was very close to the First Lady. And he had also become uh, close to her father, Loyal Davis, a, uh, a renowned physician in the Chicago area. And even though Loyal Davis was a political conservative, he was also an atheist. And this had, all, this had always really, really troubled Reagan. Um, and in the summer of 19, uh, 1984, Reagan uh, takes his usual vacation to his, his August recess, uh, vacation to his ranch in, in California. And while he's there, they get word that his father-in-law is near death. Uh, his father-in-law was in his 80s, 80s or 90s at the time, was, was very near death. Uh, just a few days left in the uh, hospital, in the nursing home there in Phoenix. And Reagan handwrites a 10-page letter to his father-in-law trying to persuade him to believe in the Christian gospel, saying that I know that you are very near death. Uh, I'm very worried about what may happen when you die. Um, I want you to know the, you know the peace and purpose I have found from trusting in Jesus for forgiveness of my sins. And he kind of lays it out. He even invokes C.S. Lewis's Lord, Liar, Lunatic argument, right? I mean, this is a very interesting letter. Um, this is not the kind of thing that a crass politician writes who doesn't really have any genuine religious faith, right? And is only going to be doing, you know, public posturing to uh, to secure the Christian vote or something. Um, and I'll come back to one or two other examples of this in a little bit in the in the, in the Cold War context. But this also was a revelation for me in the course of uh, in the course of my research, which uh, in turn helped me appreciate more the genuine conviction he brings to the religious freedom aspects of his diplomacy. Um, now. Uh, another key innovation that Reagan brings to his Cold War strategy is he is uh, rather unique among other American presidents in perceiving the vulnerabilities of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is where don't let ourselves be blinded by hindsight. One reason why I wrote this book was now that I'm a professor at University of Texas and all my students, uh, so, uh, Kelsey, I'm not singling you out for this one. Kelsey's an exception, right? Uh, but they all came of age after the end of the Cold War. And there's this growing sense of uh, uh, inevitability that, well, of course the Cold War would have ended peacefully. Of course the world would not be destroyed in a nuclear holocaust. Of course the Soviet Union was vulnerable and decrepit and uh, was prone prone to collapse. Well, very few people knew that at the time. The conventional wisdom in 1979, 80, 81, when Reagan, uh, when Reagan comes into office, is that the Soviet Union is a permanent fixture in the geopolitical landscape, that it is strong, robust, resilient. It's been with us for six decades at that point, uh, since the Bolshevik Revolution. It will be with us for at least another six decades. So again, it is a, a challenge to be managed uh, and to contained and to be contained, but it is not going away. 
Reagan has a very different theory of the case. Like I said, because he sees it as an idea to be defeated, he also you know, rather uniquely perceives a number of Soviet vulnerabilities, and, so, and he, he just does not think that that system can continue. Part of it is an economic argument. He doesn't think that a you know an inefficient command economy like that, uh, which doesn't allow uh, private pro property rights or the property function proper function of the market, which can't even feed its own people, which is why the United States has to sell grain to the to the Soviets. He doesn't think that that can continue economically, especially in an arms race. But he also sees another unique vulnerability, and it's atheism. Um, and he over and over will say, I just don't see how a society which outlaws belief in God, which has you know historic reservoirs of deep religious faith with the Orthodox Church, I uh, just don't see how that can, that can continue either. And so uh, his strategy, uh, uh, his overall Cold War strategy, it combines these uh, strands of pressure on the Soviet Union, military pressure, economic pressure, ideological pressure, uh, but also outreach, outreach, and outreach and diplomacy, because he believes that it is weak enough that with the right amounts of pressure, the system can be brought uh, to collapse. So, just a, a few examples of his uh, his interest in uh, religious faith and religious freedom behind the Iron Curtain, and seeing it as a vulnerability. Um, in um, uh, the summer of 1981, he meets with the uh, he hosts the Vatican Secretary of State uh, Casaroli uh, at, at the White House. Um, uh, he's talking uh, initially about solidar solidarity. Poland had not yet had martial law, but the solidarity movement is uh, is burgeoning, burgeoning now. Um, and, uh, and Reagan uh, then says this. He says, I wonder if in our emphasis on the impressive buildup of Soviet military power, we fail to appreciate how tenuous is the Soviet hold on the people in its empire. And of course, Poland was one of the cornerstones of the Soviet Soviet empire. Um, and, then, and then he then you know, talked at, at length with um, Kessaroli about the Pope's visit to Poland had showed the terrible hunger for God in Eastern Europe. And then Reagan continued describing reports of the fervor of the underground church in the Soviet Union uh, itself, saying, I've, I've heard stories of Bibles being distributed page by page among, among the believers. Um, I could give you many other such examples, but this is a recurring theme of his. He's always asking the CIA, in your assessments, how, you know, what are you seeing about religious faith behind the Iron Curtain? What are you seeing about religious faith in, in, the, in, in the Soviet Union? Uh, there's, you know, surely that there is more there going on than, than we appreciate. What can we do to support it? Um, so, uh, so what could he do to support it? Here's where a very important episode, which a few, Paul, I know you're going to remember this one uh, in, er in Reagan's administration, the Siberian Seven. How many, anyone here heard of the Siberian Seven? Um, okay, at least we have a few. All right, so I had, had some notion of this before, but I uh, came to appreciate even more important how, how this is really, this is Reagan's first negotiation with the Soviets on anything. So again, this will show you just how important religious freedom is for him. Very brief background for those who did not know. Um, the Siberian Seven refers to two families from Siberia who were Orthodox old believers. It was kind of a Pentecostal strain of Russian orth Orthodoxy. And because, uh, because of their efforts to practice their faith independently, they'd been thrown into the gulag for a few years in the 70s. They'd been released and then went back to the practicing their faith and then had learned that they were likely going to be arrested again. Um, they knew that the American embassy in Moscow is sovereign American diplomatic territory uh, and could be a potential refuge. And so they travel surreptitiously to Moscow. They wait outside the gates of the embassy. And one day in 1978, when the gates of the embassy swing open for, I don't know, the DCM's car to come out or something like that, they rush inside the embassy, um, right past the Marine Guards. And so, and, and they immediately say, all right, you know, we're here, please give us freedom in America. Um, well, the, it creates a real dilemma for the embassy because uh, they know that if they take the Siberian Pentecostals, the seven, you know, the Siberian Seven outside to try to uh, fly, go go to the airport and fly to the United States, they'll be arrested immediately by the KGB. So there thus ensues a several year standoff where the Siberian Seven just start living in the basement of the U.S. embassy. Um, they end up being there for for five five years. Carter, in his last couple years in office, is trying in vain to get them out. This becomes this you know international cause cause celeb, and Reagan. Um, before he's president, is absolutely captivated by, by this story, uh, by the courage of the Siberian Seven, but also by what it exemplifies about the barbarity of the Soviet system. So these seven, you know, innocent Pentecostals from the hinterlands would be the subject of such oppression by the system. And so once he becomes president, um, his first letter to Brezhnev, which he writes uh, in April of 81 as he's recovering from the assassination, half of it is appealing to Brezhnev, can you just let the Siberian Seven go? We'll take them for asylum in the United States, right? You know, I, I know you don't want them there anywhere in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, with the, you know, ca causing problems, but will you just let them go? And, and Brezhnev sends a very nasty, nasty response saying, quit, you know, interfering in our internal affairs. That's a common story. 
Over the next two years, Reagan makes continued entreaties and letters through, uh, through day Martian cables to the Soviet leadership about the Siberian 7. Um, and this baffles the Kremlin. They're on, why does this American president care so much about these seven Siberian Pentecostals? You know, we've got trade, we've got arms control, we've got, uh, you know, a lot of other bigger, bigger issues to, to address. Then in uh, February of 1983, Reagan decides it's time to do his first meeting with a Soviet official. He has not yet met with any Soviet officials uh, during his time as president. And so he and George Shultz, Secretary of State, summon over Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet ambassador. Um, and they bring him to the White House, and Reagan meets with Dobrynin for, for two hours. Uh, they, they cover a range of issues, uh, you know, uh, the Soviet uh, SS-20 deployments, the invasion of Afghanistan, the, the grain embargo, things like that. But Reagan devotes quite a bit of the time with Dobrynin to saying, what matters to me more than anything are the seven Siberian Pentecostals in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And again, this is absolutely baffling to Dobrynin. He just cannot get his mind, he cannot fathom why this American president would care about this so much. And so Reagan puts an offer on the table. He says, listen, there is no trust between our systems. We're not negotiating on anything right now. Let's start with this. If you will release those, uh, the Siberian seven and allow them to seek uh, you know, asylum in the United States, we will not say anything public about it. We will not humiliate you. We will not crow about it. Um, it will be a great uh, first step in building trust between uh, our, our governments so that we can then go on to negotiate about other things. Um, Dobrynin is baffled at this, but sends the message back to the Kremlin. Over the next few, uh, next few months, there are some back channels that go on, and it works. The Soviets quietly agree to allow a safe passage out of the embassy for the Siberian 7, uh, and then they, they fly to the United States, and they're resettled in, in Illinois. And Reagan keeps his part of the bargain. He never says anything public about it. It doesn't even come out you know, publicly until, I think, after he leaves office that they'd even, even been released. And that was, uh, you know, he still detested the Soviet system, but that was the beginnings of... Uh, uh, of building trust and seeing that he could negotiate with uh, with with these so with, the, with the, the Soviet leaders, uh, and that leads the groundwork then for the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that he concludes with Gorbachev four years later, abolishing an entire class of nuclear weapons. None of that would have been possible if it had not been for the the successful negotiation on the Siberian Seven. Two weeks after he meets with Dobrynin in February of 1983. Uh, he uh, and, and has that quiet deal arranged to release the Siberian 7, and he agrees he won't publicly crow about this. He then goes to Orlando, Florida, and speaks to the annual convention of the National Association of Evangelicals. Uh, anyone here know what he happens to say in that speech? The, yes, the evil empire, right, okay. Uh, but the context of it is very interesting, right? He's trying to, uh, the nuclear freeze movement was growing, uh, a number of evangelicals were starting to become, uh, uh, abandon their previous hardline stance against the Soviets and think of maybe, you know, maybe the Cold War is just a big misunderstanding, uh, maybe both sides are equally equally at fault. Uh, and, so, uh, and so it's in this context that Reagan is trying to remoralize, if you will, and I mean this in a, a good sense, not an ironic sense, but remind this key uh, constituency of the spiritual and moral stakes of the, of the Cold War. Uh, and so I just want to read the full passage there because it's notable, and again, it ties back into these religious freedom concerns. Um, uh, and so he says, let us pray for the salvation of all those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray that they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man, and predict its eventual domination of all the peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. And then he continues, uh, you know, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, of, de of labeling both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire. Um, and then he continues, I believe that communism is another sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages are, uh, are, now, are now even now being written. When he said that at the time, of course, he's greeted with widespread derision and outreach. Uh, so the uh, New York Times call his speech outrageous and primitive. The Washington Post calls him a religious bigot. The venerable historian Henry Steele Commager sneered, it was the worst presidential speech in American history, and I've read them all. Um, the Soviets agreed. Uh, the Kremlin's news agency, uh, TASS, uh, you know, uh, shrieked about Reagan's bellicose, lunatic, anti-communism, uh, his hypocrisy, his outright medievalism. Um, 
Interestingly, I think it's the use of the word empire that upset the Kremlin even more than evil, because of course Marxist uh, ideology says that it's the capitalists who are the imperialists, uh, and we are, you know, uh, uh, working towards the vanguard of that uh, great classless uh, that classless utopia. And so, for him to call them out for their imperialism, for the Soviets for being the empire, with how they were controlling their vassal states in Central and Eastern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe elsewhere, that's what really stung. But I mentioned there's a religious freedom component to, that, uh, to it, and it's this. Um, those same words which outraged American liberals and, uh, and offended the Kremlin inspired the victims of Soviet tyranny. And at the time, the most eminent uh, dissident and prisoner of conscience in the Soviet Union was Natan Sharansky, the Jewish refusenik, uh, the great critic of the Kremlin, who at that point had spent, I think, seven years in the Gulag. Reagan had also become very captivated by his plight, uh, as he was with uh, the plight of uh, all, all Soviet Jews, uh, many of whom were trying to have, uh, exercise their right to freedom of emigration to emigrate to Israel. Um, and so sitting in his prison cell a few weeks after Reagan's speech, you know, the news did not travel so, so quickly, Sharansky was given a Soviet newspaper article condemning Reagan's use of the word evil empire. So he's given a copy of Pravda. His jailer said, all right, here's a copy of Pravda. You know, and you can see what that awful American president said about us a few weeks ago. And Sharansky was overjoyed. He tapped on his cell wall a coded message to his fellow inmates, inmates reporting what the American president had dared to say. And as word spread through the prison population, shouts of joy erupted. Sharansky recalls, that moment made it impossible for anyone in the West to, get, to continue closing their eyes to the real nature of the Soviet Union. It was one of the most important freedom-affirming declarations, and we all instantly knew it. For us, that was the moment that really marked the end for them and the beginning for us. Reagan continued to advocate fiercely with the Soviets uh, for Sharansky's release, and eventually he does succeed in uh, getting Sharansky released in 19, 1986. Uh, we had to trade a couple of KGB spies for him, but it was, uh, it was cer cer certainly, certainly worth it. Um, and again, for Reagan, uh, part of it was the humanitarian appeal of Sharansky's suffering and his nobility, but also Sharansky as this individual case exemplified for Reagan the wickedness of this system, which would persecute uh, individual religious, religious believers like that. I should mention also, also, I, uh, uh, because of, of Sharansky being Jewish, um, Reagan, uh, took, more than any other president, took extraordinary measures to, uh, to support so Soviet Jews, not just getting them released from prison or the freedom to emigrate, but um, I got this from Max Campbellman, who'd been his ambassador to the o OSCE, who uh, I know Nathaniel and I share a great affinity for Max. Um, but uh, summer of 1985, Reagan sends Campbellman on a tour of all of our allied capital capitals in Western Europe, uh, bearing, and Campbellman goes to you know, all of the heads of state there with letters from Reagan saying, I have learned that the, so uh, the KGB are harassing Soviet Jews outside the Moscow synagogue on Friday nights uh, and not letting them go in for uh, Shabbat services. And I've ordered the U.S. Embassy in Moscow to station our diplomats right outside the uh, the, the synagogue to, as a show of solidarity, but I don't want it to just be an American-Soviet thing. And so he appeals successfully for essentially all of our NATO allies to send their diplomats to stand outside the Moscow synagogue on Friday nights as well in a show of solidarity with uh, with, so, with so, so, Soviet Soviet Jews. So again, this is what I mean about this personal commitment to the religious diplomacy in the in the Cold War. Um, all right, uh, many other things I could tell you, but I'm going to skip forward to the end. Um, the nice thing about writing a narrative history is uh, I don't think I'm giving away too much when I say the good guys win at the end. All right, okay. Um, but Reagan's 1988 summit, his final summit with, with Gorbachev in Moscow in, in 1988, uh, I think really, uh, really culminates these, uh, these, all these different values. It's his personal faith, his belief in the the vulnerability of the of the Soviet Union because of its its atheism, his support for dissidents there. Um, and I just want to read one more excerpt right before his first summit meeting with Gorbachev, which leads into this final one. So before his first summit meeting with Gorbachev in Geneva in 1985, um, Reagan is meeting with one of, his, uh, one of his aides a few minutes before Gorbachev is going to be arriving. And the aide just asks him, you know, all right, Mr. President, how are you feeling? And how do you think this whole thing is going to end? And Reagan says this, these communist systems will crumble by the sheer fact that a growing majority of people living under their rule have a pent-up desire to be free to worship more than the state. And this demand to know and worship God and to have a free and open relationship with him is what will bring totalitarianism and communism down. 
and they said the people will do it themselves, but we need to do everything we can to help them accomplish this. Right? So, uh, so that's right before his first meeting with Gorbachev. So fast forward to May of 1988. This is Reagan's first time setting foot inside the Soviet Union. It's going to be his final summit meeting with, with Gorbachev. They've signed the INF Treaty. They've started to reduce uh, the number of nuclear weapons uh, dramatically, including abolishing an entire class of nuclear weapons. The Soviets have agreed to withdraw their, their, their occupying troops from, from Afghanistan. The Cold War really is beginning to thaw. But Reagan is, Reagan is not yet done. Um, and so when he goes to uh, when he when he goes to, when he goes to Moscow, uh, while having built this you know built this close friendship with, uh, with 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 Gorbachev, he doesn't want to relinquish the pressure. There still are hundreds of Christian Jewish dissidents in prison. Many others who are uh, quietly active but not having the the, the the freedom for their activism. And so Reagan hosts a luncheon at Spaso House, the American ambassador's residence, for a hundred Christian and um, and Jewish di Jewish dissidents. Uh, this is somewhat embarrassing. Gorbachev, but Reagan is sending here. He said, "You know, my relationship is not just with you; it is with all of your people." And I, and uh, even though we're seeing great signs of progress with Perestroika and Glasnost and and, and what and what uh, you know these these other, these other reforms, um, uh, it is still not enough. Uh, and so it continues that personal diplomacy on behalf of the. Um, uh, of, uh, of religious religious distance there, and then his speech at Moscow at Moscow State Un University, uh, just you know, a, an extraordinary moment. The first time an American president's been allowed to speak openly in the Soviet Union to give an uh, un uncensored and un unjammed speech. Um, uh, uh, he he makes a very direct appeal, uh, you know, no more evil empire condemnations. So rather, he's trying to persuade Gorbachev and the Soviet people to embrace religious freedom, to embrace uh, belief belief in God. Um, and he, he says this: freedom, it has been said, makes people selfish and materialistic. But Americans are one of the most religious peoples on earth, because they know that liberty, just as life itself, is not earned but a gift from God. They seek to share that gift with the world. Positive change must be rooted in traditional values, in land, and culture, and family and community, and it must take its life from the eternal things, from the source of all life, which is faith. Um, so again, he Reagan, the evangelist for freedom, the evangelist for faith, the evangelist for, for God Himself, has taken that message very directly to the Soviet people, um, and uh, you know interviewed and talked to a number who were there in, in the room that day and in Moscow they day, that day and say, they say it was absolutely electric. But there's a final moment, and this brings back full circle what I was sharing with you earlier about Reagan writing that letter to his dying father-in-law trying to persuade him to, to believe in God. One reason why I included in that, that in, the, in this book is that it anticipates Reagan's final meeting with, with Gorbachev in May of 1988. And Reagan spends their last negotiating session together, not talking about further reductions in nuclear arms, not talking about the balance of conventional forces in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, not talking about the Nicaraguan Revolution, trying to persuade Gorbachev himself to believe in God. At this point, they've become close personal friends, and Reagan is very worried about Gorbachev's soul. And Reagan speaks very personally to Gorbachev. He sh Reagan shares with Gorbachev his grief that his own son, Ron, is an atheist. Uh, he tries different apologetic devices, trying to persuade Gorbachev, how can one believe uh, in the existence of matter without knowing who the prime mover was behind it, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's almost kind of channeling his own inner Thomist. Um, uh, uh, and and Gorbachev doesn't know what to do with this. He knows that this is sincere. You know, this is not public posturing. These are very very pri private meetings, uh, and he's not he's not persuaded to believe in God. But he sees a whole new dimension to his his now his now friend Ron, Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, and like I said, I think for me it really culminates Reagan's great quest was not just to defeat Soviet communism as an evil and vile idea, but to free the peoples from its, its enforced atheism, including the chief communist himself, um, and, and persuade him of the, of the truth of God. Um, so then, uh, finally, I've been asked some questions before about where the title of the book comes from. Of course, my fellow believers in the room will recognize it comes from the Sermon, Sermon on the Mount, but it also comes from Gorbachev himself. Um, here's a closing scene for you. June of 2004, some of us were in D.C. on that day, uh, in, in, that, in that month. Um, on, on June 10th, Reagan has just died, and his casket is lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda. And mourners and those honoring him are lined up for miles. You know, the, the, you know it takes about a week for everyone to be able to get through and do it. Uh, and then a, a surprise visitor shows up, um, and it's Gorbachev himself. Um, and he, uh, he's able to usher up to the front of the line. Nobody has know, had known that he was going to be coming. And he, he rubs Reagan's uh, casket rather mournfully um, and, uh, and, and gives it a pat. Um, 
and uh, bows his head in silence for, for a couple minutes. Um, and then as he's walking out, uh, a reporter from CBS News asks him, you know, why are you here? What did you make of this Reagan guy? And Gorbachev says this, he was an extraordinary political leader who decided at the right moment to be a peacemaker. So thank you very much. It's great to be with you. I'd love to take any questions again. So. Nathaniel with the Women's Freedom Institute. There are, of course, differences between the Soviet Union and contemporary China. But I'm wondering, having gone so deep into Reagan's approach to the Soviet Union, what lessons should uh, contemporary American decision makers take from Reagan's engagement with the Soviet Union that could potentially apply to our engagement with China? support for religious freedom, but certainly well, well beyond that. Yeah, no, I've been getting this question a lot as I've been doing different book talks for obvious reasons because it is a big one. It's one I've given a lot of thought to. I always have to give the obligatory historian's disclaimers about the differences. Okay, so there are differences, and see me during cocktail hour if you want to talk about the differences. Okay, you know, the main one being uh, the deeper economic interdependence between the United States and communist China, and then, of course, they're not really being a comparable Warsaw Pact or things like that. But I think the similarities are uh, are, are more, more compelling, and I do think that... Um, Beginning with what I described earlier as Reagan's theory of the case about the Cold War being primarily, primarily a battle of ideas, uh, I think we have lost the primacy of that right now as we're thinking about China. We still put it too much in these great power competition. And, and I, I will affirm some of that frame, right? I mean, there's certainly those, those elements. But um, at the end of the day, this is not just about you know, uh, one ascending power and one status quo power uh, who happen to have large economies and large militaries. This is a rivalry between two fundamentally different uh, political systems and, and, and worldviews, and so much more follows from that. Uh, I think that was key to Reagan's uh, strategic diagnosis for the Soviet Union, and I think we need to bring that back to the forefront. And from that, there are, uh, you know, a number of derivative lines of effort. Um, you know, the obvious one you've already mentioned is, um, uh, seen many of the Chinese people as our natural allies and as victims of their government. Uh, and again, you know, it's hard to generalize about the sentiment of 1.3 you know, billion people, but um, I just was struck that um, uh, Reagan's consistent outreach to uh, the, the Soviet people, the way he drew a distinction between the system of Soviet communism and the peoples of the Soviet Union, especially the, the, the Russian people, uh, and particularly that, you know, just about every uh, Soviet religious believer, Christian or Jew, uh, came to realize that they have an ally in Ronald Reagan, and they have an ally in the United States. Uh, and that back of the envelope test, and I know many of you here are rightly dedicating your lives to that, but let it be said uh, by every Chinese religious believer as well, that if they would ask that question, yes, we have an ally in, in the United States, and so much follows from that. Uh, another, uh, I hadn't mentioned this earlier, but important part of Reagan's uh, you know, ideological warfare, if you will, against the Soviets was on the information operations front. And a lot of this is overt, right? It was you know, massive increases in support for Voice of America, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. A uh, friend and colleague of mine now at the University of Texas named Mark Pomar has just written a terrific book on this, by the way, um, on Cold War radios. Uh, just came out a couple weeks before mine. He ran Radio for Europe, Radio Liberties, um, you know, kind of Russia, uh, Soviet broadcasting efforts during the 1980s. So it's part scholarly book, but part memoir. And, and he recounts in there how half the time what they were broadcasting was sermons. I mean, so this was not just, you know, news reports, or whatever, like, uh, uh, and he said, oh, we, we knew very much at, at the radios that uh, because the people's behind the Iron Curtain were not having, you know, open access to religious content that, um, uh, and, and so many of our staff were exiles. Right, uh, so he said. So let's uh, let's broadcast uh, let's broadcast ser sermons for them. So Reagan didn't, like tripled the budget for the broadcasting. He and JFK are the only two American presidents to have ever visited the headquarters, at Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. Uh, you know, doing that very much as a as a symbolic <coughs> show, show of support. So the information front, another one, and then CIA was doing all sorts of covert actions. These have been declassified. I'm not giving anything away here now. Um, smuggling uh, Bibles, Qurans, you know, any, any religious text uh, in you know, local languages behind behind the Iron Curtain, um, as well as uh, you know, Solzhenitsyn uh, novels. Uh, it, so the um, so on every front, you know, on broadcasting, on printing of contraband literature, uh, you know, Reagan and his team uh, really uh, waged the, the the battle of ideas and, and and information warfare. And again, there's some very good efforts going on with China uh, towards China on that right now, but we're not doing enough. Whatever we're doing, it is it is not enough. So that's another one. 
I, you know, during cocktail time, I can get some of the defense wonk stuff too. There's a very interesting story on the Reagan defense modernization, uh, much more than just a build up. It was not just about spending more money on the on on the Pentagon, but what the types of weapon systems we were procuring and how that strengthened diplomacy. Uh, but those those are some initial ones I'll give you. Thanks. So. Yes, Kelly. Um, great to see you. Great um, to see you too. I have a question for kind of the the intercession of the domestic kind of political time during Reagan and then his foreign policy piece. Mm -hmm. um, the speech in Florida, I think, is really interesting. Like at an evangelical conference, mm -hmm. kind of is trying to make a foreign policy issue um, tied to kind of the view of American Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, kind of, what were some of those big roadblocks? Like, how did he kind of go about? both articulating his reasons for kind of framing the Cold War in this somewhat of a religious warfare standpoint, mm -hmm. and what was the pushback from the evangelical community in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. So kind of what did that look like as far as convincing them to hear about it, convincing them to kind of um, get behind that and not lose the political base that he had built? Yeah. No, very good question. So first I, I need to say is even though I was telling you about some of the evangelical community being um, – you know, attracted, seduced, if you will, if I can use a little bit more loaded term, by uh, by the nuclear freeze campaign. By and large, they were still a very devoted uh, base of support for him, right? Uh, and this was the big change from Carter in '76, who had gotten most of the born again vote, and then and then Reagan captures most of it in 1980. And he was, uh, and, and a lot of this in turn was for domestic uh, domestic reasons, right? He was very pro, very pro life. Um, he was supportive of a school prayer amendment, things like that. Mm -hmm. So some of the uh, evangelical priorities then. And if you read the Evil Empire speech speech, two-thirds of it is a domestic policy speech, right? So it's not a, I read you the foreign policy excerpts where he brings that in, but most of it uh, is, again, about abortion, school prayer. Um, uh, and so he already had a resonance with them. But, you know, then as now, there's a lot of ferment within different religious communities. Um, he was, a, if anything, even more worried about uh, uh, the um, American Catholics, uh, and he was especially seized with liberation theology, and he was really worried about the inroads that that was making. This is another affinity he has with uh, with the Pope, being very worried about liberation theology's inroads in Central and South America, but also with a lot of a lot of the Catholic left. Um, and so he uh, also also spent to, you know quite a bit of time trying trying to uh, address that. Even at one point, uh, he you know Bill Casey, is CIA director, uh, very devout Catholic, Bill Casey and Michael Novak put on a, a day long CIA conference on the problems of liberation theology and kind of how can we how can we address this right so they were uh, taking that very seriously so yeah so for, so so for Reagan um, he is trying to he's you know certainly trying to you know keep faith with these religious constituencies uh, uh, he you know, the great communicator, he really took the art of persuasion very seriously. He knew that with this, you know, rather dramatic new direction in the Cold War, he was trying to persuade the American people, including the, the, the tax burden to, to support the defense buildup, that he needed to explain to them why he was doing this and where he was trying, where he was trying, trying to take that. So, um, but he was speaking into a, a pretty, pretty friendly, friendly audience there too. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, Scott. Um, thanks for doing this book. The blurbs are so impressive that either it's a tour de force or you just know all the right people. Yeah, <laughs> a little. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but that, I mean, I, I can't wait to, to sort of to read it. Uh, easy question because I know it's been a long day. So, does your book come down on on his spirit animal, hedgehog or fox? Oh, very good one. Um, more hedgehog. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Hedgehog. Yeah. Or hedgehog. So that, but my but my bigger question is sort of to think about the sort of these typologies you know, of, say, like a Walter Russell movie, mm -hmm. and to see where, where a Reagan fits in, to see, does he fit into one of those typologies, or is this a new, is this something new, mm -hmm. right? Because I always, I'm not, I'm never satisfied with this notion of, you know, sort of Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian, mm -hmm. or Jacksonian, Wilsonian sort of, you know, slots, mm -hmm. because, because, because it's, it's, because all these things in the meat, in the meat context are drawn from domestic politics, and yeah. domestic sources as well, plus a sort of a, a global vision. Mm -hmm. So is this a new sort of typology of American conservatism? Because mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as I see it, Reagan, I mean, sort of Jeffersonians and Jacksonians probably both like peace through strength, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So, I mean, uh, Hamilton would like the, the trade angle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Wilsonian, at least on the right wing, would like the fact that he went after the Soviet Union. Oh, yeah, and, and his Westminster address, on which you get the National Endowment for Democracy and all the derivative organizations, so, yeah. Right, so is this something, is this something new? Is this an American conservatism mm -hmm. and then drawn from, from what? Is it some of his religious perspective? Is it some of his 
this Hollywood perspective mean? Is this something new in the sort of a, a Reagan sort of approach? Um, and then, I mean, I was going to ask about you know the, the sort of applying that and whether or not anyone has applied that you know uh, since him. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's sort of a different question. But I mean, I don't know if you're if you have a thought on that. Yeah, wow, very good. So, um, you know, the closest president we've had to trying to replicate Reaganism is George W. Bush, the one that I worked for, you know, others of us did here. Now, um, Bush, you know, I think it would be safe to say failed in some respects, and Iraq and Afghanistan would be the exemplars there. And again, obviously, we all know there's some very complicated histories with those wars, and I sure. worked on it in my policy time. But, but in terms of Bush self-consciously wanted to place himself in that Reaganite tradition of uh, – uh, especially a values-based uh, 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 American international leadership, right? Um, the the formative uh, strains of Reagan's convictions, and this is my backdoor way of getting back around to the Mead typology, are certainly his faith. I think I've you know made made the case there, but also history. Um, and he is very much a child of the 30s and 40s. And for him, the big takeaways are from the 1930s. Uh, a deep aversion to protectionism and isolationism. And he sees uh, those as you know, the twin toxins of the 1930s, and he's very concerned about their resurgence in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and again, you know, those of us of an you know, older vintage here who can remember the 1980s, it was a protectionist decade, right? Everyone in Congress wanted to uh, you know, slap more tariffs on Japan, get in trade wars with uh, the, the Asian tigers, and Reagan fiercely resisted that. Okay, so that's where his, his Hamiltonian side come out. But the other, uh, when I mentioned the 1940s too, um, and again, here this is a it's going to be a little vignette also that gets into some of the roots of his um, uh, his hostility to anti-Semitism. Even though his uh, near blindness, his very poor eyesight, made him 4F, and so he couldn't serve in combat during the war because he's a Hollywood actor. He uh, instead is uh, making training films for the Army Air Corps during the time. You know, training films, propaganda films. Um, but uh, he's very much formed by the World War II experience on the, uh, the, the importance of allies. You know, this is why he becomes, I think, the American president in our history most committed to allies, even though he knew how vex, uh, vexing they could be. But he's very drawn, especially to the Anglo-American alliance with Churchill and FDR, and that's you know, partly his, his affinities with, with Thatcher. Um, and also, and you see this, go back and reread, or even better, rewatch his Boys of Point Du Hoc speech uh, from June, June, of June 6 of 1984. It's a great tribute to the Normandy generation. The, the rangers who are right there in front of him. But it's also a clarion call against isolationism and in defense of the free world. It even says very explicitly, you know, we have our troops over here because we've learned that we cannot seek isolation across, you know, behind the security of our, of our borders while threats gather, right? Um, uh, and so that is very much a part of his worldview. Uh, one, but just because I mentioned the Hollywood training films and our uh, interest here in religious freedom, religious persecution, in early 1945, uh, he is, uh, because he's doing these training films for the military, he's also getting a lot of their battlefield footage that's being, that's being sent back. Um, and he has sent uh, early footage from the American troops who, liberate, who liberated Buchenwald. And as he sees the, the, these films of, you know, you know, thousands of dead Jewish bodies, uh, they're, they're in the concentration camp, uh, the emaciated survivors, he is absolutely horrified at this, and he makes a copy of the film, and he keeps it with him the rest of his life. And I actually, it was George Schultz who told me this. And so when Schultz is a Secretary of State 40 years later, um, uh, Reagan shows Schultz this film and says, if you want to know why I'm so opposed to anti-Semitism, it's this. I saw what it's it, at its most ugly. And even said, and I saw how this is, uh, and this is Schultz's translation, you know, Schultz is, I'm getting this from Schultz via Reagan. Uh, uh, um, he says, uh, this shows uh, Reagan how anti-Semitism is often a leading, ed, in, leading indicator of totalitarianism. Uh, and, and so this is why he is so captivated with the plight of Soviet Jews, because he similarly sees them as the canaries in the coal mine, if you will, for, for Soviet so totalitarianism. So that whole uh, uh, confluence of World War II influences is very, very uh, formative for him. And he regularly references it as, as president. He's appealing to the American people. This is why you know, we, we need to stand fast with our free world allies. Uh, this is why isolationism and protectionism are, are, not, are not the answer. But finally, the one other one I'm just going to mention is Vietnam's also an important experience for him, just seeing the traumas it inflicts on the nation and uh, the disasters of having a you know, large ground troop deployment uh, in you know, the middle of an you know, anti-communist struggle, which is also a civil war, uh, with their hands tied. You know, all the maladies of Vietnam. Um, and so this is why Reagan is very 
uh, reticent about actually deploying ground troops in combat. In his eight years as president, he only deploys ground troops in combat once. Anyone know what that, what that was? Grenada, exactly. And it's over in a weekend, right? Beirut uh, was a peacekeeping mission that's got its own set of complications and problems uh, as well. Um, but, uh, and he had plenty of other options too, but he's very careful about that. And so this is where there's a little bit of even that Jeffersonianism yeah. uh, uh, too. Um, uh, it, again, a contrast with his, uh, his successor, George H.W. Bush, a great president in many ways. He's only in office for four years, half as long as Reagan. And he does two ground troop deployments that are much bigger, uh, just cause in Panama, regime change there. Uh, and then of course, uh, desert, de de desert storm. Um, both successful operations, I'm not meaning to criticize, but again, that's where Reagan, for all, for all the defense buildup for this, you know, public image of him as this bellicose warmonger, he's actually very restrained about the use of force. Rather, he's much more focused on a strong military strengthening our diplomacy. Um, and that's why he deploys the, the Pershing II and ground launch cruise missiles um, in Western Europe to threaten the Soviets. Mm -hmm. Gorbachev says these are like a pistol pointed at our head, right? And this is what brings Gorbachev back to the negotiating table. So there's a much more sophisticated integration of force and diplomacy in Reagan's statecraft than I had previously appreciated before before doing the book. And so do you think it's a new strain being able to take from all Oh, yeah, your original question. But you don't have to answer okay. that because yeah. that maybe yeah. it's not answerable. Yeah. It's what he's taking from all, but is it a new strain? An yeah, I think so. I, yeah, you know, we, we, yeah, Reaganism, I guess. We can't, we can't put him in one of those four camps. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, before Scott asks another question. No, yeah, I'm not okay. going to ask another question, Tom. Are you retiring, Tom? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's a question for another evening. Okay. We're going to take, we're not going to end this. We're going to take it in and add food and wine to it. Nice. So, and there are also some books out here, and I wonder if Will might be willing to, I mean, to yeah, sign yeah, one happy, or two. Happy to sign them, so. Will you join me in thanking this wonderful <laughs> speaker and author? Thank you.